you a chance to talk to the former World Bank President Robert Zolik, and this is part two. I got his thoughts on the growing relationship between the world's two largest economies. And he says in order for this week's talks to be effective, both countries must be clear about their growth paths. Well, I think the challenge for a true strategic economic dialogue is to move beyond the individual complaints of the day, whether they be of investment issues or environmental topics or currency, or a big one is going to be the whole cybersecurity issue, and devote appropriate time to those, but to really look at these long-term structural changes for each economy and see how they can be supportive. So in particular, you have a new uh, Chinese uh, set of leaders. They are looking and signaling about the nature of the structural reforms they need to ta undertake to avoid the so-called middle income trap, the, the, the process where historically countries start to slow their growth and productivity when they get to certain income levels. I think the Chinese uh, leaders have signaled the direction. We'll probably see more later in the year with the third plenum, the specifics of their policies. And there will be steps in those policies that the U.S. and other countries could be mutually supportive. So, for example, China's grown particularly through manufacturing. It's going to need to expand competition and productivity and growth in the services industry. This is one of the things Japan had failed to do for some 20 years. Those openings could provide opportunities for expansion of the private sector in China for services, but also foreign involvement. Similarly, cross-investment. Similarly, if in China you need to move up the value chain, you're going to have to have better intellectual property rights protections. So my point is, if an economic dialogue is to be strategic, not just a series of exchange of talking points, each side should outline its structural growth agenda and see how they could complement each other bilaterally and, ideally, through multilateral groups such as the WTO Services Negotiation or the Information Technology Accord or areas like uh, cooperation in the IMF and World Bank. Mr. Zellick, what, what about foreign exchange? You've gone on the record uh, with the Chinese Yuan a number of times in the past, um, and in some cases even, even a bit critical. You know, as it stands today, a couple years later, is it still s such a hot topic, or has that been deflated a bit? It's a sensitive issue, but frankly, it's been overtaken by some others, particularly in the cybersecurity and uh, some of the issues related to intellectual property rights. I think that if China follows through on its plans over time to open its capital account, to uh, make the financial markets more competitive and international, that will by its very nature uh, alleviate some of this challenge. So you, I just saw a letter that was sent by some of the members of the U.S. Congress to the U.S. Trade Representative and the, and the administration, to the administrative, di the, the SED dialogue. And you can see the currency is an issue, but it's no longer one of the very top ones. So it's not one that I think one can take off the, uh, the agenda, but I think that some of the appreciation of the RMB, some of the other changes have eased some of that for now. And if China has the pathway to move towards an open capital account, that's a flexible exchange rate system right. that will have markets decide. Let me ask you, uh, shift gears very slightly here. You recently spoke in Shanghai talking about sort of the great powers to, to business and, and different leaders in China. Tell me a little bit about what you told the folks there that you spoke to and what the response was. Well, the idea was that I noticed that President Xi Jinping and the Chinese authorities had been talking about a new type of great power relationship based on their reading of history, and that Tom Donlan, the former national security advisor for President Obama, had engaged on this topic. So at a very general level, they've started to discuss the idea that the two countries should have the type of meetings that they had in California so they would engage on this, but they hadn't spelled out in much detail what it might involve, whether economics, security, other issues. So what I was speaking about at the Shanghai Forum and was printed as an article in the National Interest recently was to try to offer some specific ideas on how you might have win-win possibilities, mutual cooperation, as you have a rising power in the case of China, but also the United States still representing 22, 23 percent of the world GDP and also in its own way a very innovative power. 